so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present um, a look at one regiment. Um, I've been collecting photographs and other things for going on 40 years and, and growing up in one community uh, in Western Pennsylvania, Newcastle, Pennsylvania, when I first started buying things at flea markets and house sales, whenever I'd stumble across a photo album or um, Civil War stuff that was local, I kept it. And I'm really glad I did because I've been able to, over the years, amass a collection of almost 300 photographs from one regiment. And, in, and by having that mass um, of photos, I've been able to see certain trends, um, certain things that are similar. Um, and, and that's kind of what I want to show today is by looking at one regiment, what, what you have going on. Now, these guys are uh, not, not only neighbors, but they are, um, they are uh, fathers, sons, brothers, brother-in-laws, cousins. So there's uh, familiar f familiar facial things that are, are alike. I'll show you some of the looks of the, the, the region. Uh, for the most part, this regiment is a uh, Scotch-Irish uh, Presbyterian. In fact, they were called the Roundheads. Uh, the 100th Pennsylvania was called the Roundhead Regiment. And that was a tip of the hat to Simon Cameron, who allowed the regiment to be raised, uh, who was a direct descendant of Cromwell's Roundheads, as uh, were uh, many of the men in the, in the 100th Regiment. So with that, I'm gonna just uh, share my screen. And uh, there we go. I'm gonna start from the beginning. Mike, so, does, any of, does any of your presentation have audio? Not at all, no. Okay, very good. Yeah, I am the audio. Uh, so uh, we're gonna look at uniforms, trends, and kind of, you know, re revelations that come from that. And uh, I'm gonna start, I've broken it up into some rough categories. So this one is, uh, we're gonna look at 1861, uh, what leaving home, what men looked like as civilians and um, their, their transformation into being soldiers. And then uh, I'm lucky enough to have uh, several examples of uh, these soldiers in their militia uniforms, their Pennsylvania militia uniforms, um, before they received their blue uniforms. Uh, this is a soldier who enlisted, in fact, this picture was taken on the day the regiment uh, left uh, Lawrence County on August 21st, 1861. Is a, is a man uh, named, uh, his last name is Hunter of Company B. He became a sergeant. He served the whole war, but, um, you know, looking at his civilian outfit, um, nothing military at all, but again, uh, the transformation is going to come from, from citizen to soldier. Uh, here is uh, a, a soldier named uh, Lostetter from Pulaski, Pennsylvania, with, uh, I assume it's his brother. There's a, there's a very similar look at them. Uh, in their faces, but here uh, he's wearing the gray uniform of the Pennsylvania militia. And you might notice that it has, um, I found all kinds of neat things on this uh, program, but it has uh, uh, sleeve stripes here and a little bit of collar piping. And I found that um, that this uh, is, is not consistent in a lot of the Pennsylvania militia uniforms. And I don't know why. It may be something that went by companies it may have been something that was just handed out like that. I'm not certain. The, the fact is, I mean, the thing to remember is the gray uniform. Here's another soldier, a young soldier uh, named uh, Hennen, um, Josiah Hennen. He um, is wearing the gray uniform, and you can see um, his uniform is, is piped in black. The Pennsylvania cap has a black border and a, uh, it's a gray, gray top, eagle buttons, um, very, very typical of uh, what, what this uniform is like. And when I picked up uh, this photograph along with other things from the family, I was lucky enough to get his hat. It was in the trunk. So here you have a really good view of, uh, of the hat with the black, um, the kepi, uh, I should say, uh, with a black band, tarred leather, uh, uh, chin strap, very cheap buckle, different than the buckle you're gonna see in uh, federal issued stuff. And he has decorated his cap visor with whirling stars and flags and underneath, his name appears actually underneath it, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's another, another man um, 
fortunate enough to have several views of him named Robert Moffat that shows him uh, from the time that he is a civilian. Um, he's a civilian. And you'll, you'll notice like um, civilians who have their pictures taken, you know, photography, a few words about photography. First of all, it was still sort of new. It was becoming affordable enough that people could have their picture taken. Um, it, it's not like having a portrait done in a, by a, a painter, but uh, uh, if you had a little bit of money, uh, n normally this means upper middle class or, or a higher class people uh, would have their, their pictures done in a local studio in a town. So Robert Moffat uh, is wearing very nice clothing, which probably attests to the fact that he's a professional or comes from a, a family that had some uh, standing in the community. And this picture was taken shortly before the war. And then we get him in his Pennsylvania gray uniform. Um, he has, uh, he does not have piping around uh, the collar and, and he does have the black band here on his cap. Um, he's armed. Uh, and, and again, we look at, we look at photographs taken. Uh, where were they taken? Um, what's the guy trying to say to us? You know, what's he showing us? in equipment um, or, or pieces that he's holding. And um, just a, a moment captured in time, uh, he's wearing a, a revolver on his belt, um, pretty typical uh, otherwise. And these two pictures obviously were taken at the same time, um, one standing, one, one uh, seated. Um, and they, uh, he, he has removed the cloth from his, um, from his jacket in this one picture. He becomes a sergeant uh, in uh, May of 1862. This picture was taken in Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, we know this, um, that there's a lot of discussion going on in the photograph world about painted backdrops. You see this painted backdrop here. And this one with the palm trees and the flag on the table is peculiar to Beaufort, South Carolina in 1862. So uh, you'll see a number of uh, photographs as we move through with the same background. Um, he's uh, become, he became a sergeant then. Uh, he's wearing a regular federal issue uniform, no stripes on his trousers. Uh, he's, uh, the, this, these have been tinted. Um, that was a popular um, method of uh, enhancing a photograph at the time. Generally, they would tint the metal parts, bayonet, scabbard, buttons, buckle, but uh, misleading, so misleadingly so, they've tinted his uh, chevrons yellow as if they may be cavalry, but in fact, he is an infantry soldier. Uh, he attained um, the rank of captain in uh, November of 1864. So you see that um, he's aged a little bit um, and uh, he's just wearing pretty much a standard uh, federal infantry officer's uniform, single bordered, captain straps. Um, this tie is something that I see a lot in uh, these Pencil Western Pennsylvania soldiers and others. And it's not particular to the Western Pennsylvania men, but uh, it's really just a ribbon tie. And you'll see it as we walk through these in different, um, different configurations. This is another officer who we, I have several photographs of, James Harvey Klein. A civilian. Uh, his uh, he lived in Plain Grove, Pennsylvania. Family was uh, pretty well to do, uh, and again, he's he's dressed um, uh, in pretty nice clothing. And you know, and you would because the photograph not only was expensive, but it was um, a way to uh, <coughs> to show your status uh, and obviously to share with with other people. Klein becomes a, a captain in the hundredth Pennsylvania. So here you see. This is the full boat. You know, you get the you get the infantry horn with the metallic letters for 100. The Hardy Hat Eagle, officers Hardy Eagle, um, uh, shoulder straps. Difficult to tell, but by the size of them, they look like they're double borders. Shoulder straps came with with varying uh, amounts of borders around the frame. This is the frame. A single border is the cheapest. A double border is um, a little a bump up. But the most expensive were triple borders, and it's like wearing a neon sign. They're huge. They have three borders of bullion around, 
And when they were new, um, they were very bright. So you imagine them against uh, a dark blue uniform and uh, you could see them from, from pretty far off. So this is not a, a field photograph, but again, it was taken um, in Newcastle, uh, probably in 1862. He had, he had been in South Carolina, was captured and released. So I, I think this photograph was taken at that time uh, when he went home before he joined the regiment, rejoined the regiment. Here he is in South Carolina palm trees, the flag, um, standard uniform, uh, standard federal uniform. Uh, gauntlets are interesting. Um, you know, this is this photo is in the field. It's not in, in Washington. So this is something that um, these men had, these officers had uh, uh, access to and, and seemed to be wearing. Uh, he was promoted finally to major in 1864. Um, and uh, this is the photograph of him there. Again, uh, pretty typical federal uniform. Note, note the larger straps here. These are, these are double at least or maybe triple bordered straps. Another soldier, uh, Elisha Bracken, an enlisted man. On the left, he was a school teacher, um, kind of uh, wearing uh, civilian clothes with a big cravat, a big silk cravat. And on the right, he's uh, lost the sideburns and um, is a sergeant in his company, Company C. Uh, he would be killed later at the uh, Battle of the Crater, um, but um, he, again, is just wearing pretty, pretty standard federal clothing, nothing, uh, nothing unusual to, to really set him apart. So the regiment is getting, we're seeing the regiment is getting their issue of federal clothing in 1862, and that's what they're wearing or happen to be photographed yet. Uh, another officer in this one, um, to show you the, uh, the, I just got my stuff and it's all brand new look. Uh, this is Edward Bowsman. Uh, he's got uh, everything you can imagine. Um, you can see here, he's got uh, the cap with 100, uh, large, uh, large shoulder straps, double borders. Um, this sash is just hugely insane. These are gigantic tassels on the sash. And also notice you'll see in a, in a number of pictures, how these guys, they apparently don't have a knot tied back there, but they have a, the extra looped over and then coming back over the belt. And another thing is uh, metal scabbarded swords. Uh, you'll see a lot, again, as we move through, of uh, these men wearing uh, metal scabbard swords. Um, the alternative, of course, is a leather scabbard sword. Uh, they were cheaper um, and uh, uh, there's, um, they, they're probably easier to use in the field because they're lighter. And these metal scabbard swords may have been presented from people at home um, or by, by men, but um, they, they certainly are a bump up as well um, to your regular um, foot officer's sword. Here's Bowsman again um, later uh, in uh, 1862 uh, without all the flash. Uh, he seems to have a, a pin on the side of his hat and uh, he's wearing pretty standard federal gear, single bordered straps. So, dress to kill. Um, here, this guy, although he's uh, kind of frumpy, um, I, and I don't know who he is, um, some photographs and you, you'll see are, are uh, labeled with the, with, the, with the soldier's name, and, and many of them aren't, unfortunately. So it's a guessing game, a process of elimination, or finding a duplicate photo of the same, same type. But here, this, this stuff's pretty new. I imagine this is around 1862, the uh, large infantry hunting horn with the numerals, um, sash coming over the belt, metal scabbard sword. Um, his clothing looks like it had been stored. Um, it's kind of uh, wrinkled uh, as opposed to some of the other guys whose stuff looks pretty uh, new, like they just bought it or were more careful than, than this particular officer. Three officers um, photographed in South Carolina um, on uh, duty um, at the Fuller House. I think it's the Fuller House. So actually, need to check that. Uh, this is uh, Samuel uh, George Leisure. He was the son of the colonel. Um, so he did a lot of work as adjutant and uh, a few other soldiers here. But this is a, a photograph that speaks to, um, you know, what they would have been doing um, out of, outdoors, um, in the theater of war, not fighting, 
uh, simple um, foot officer sword, pretty much regulation stuff, sashes. Again, we're talking about 1862, so that's something that um, would have been um, pretty prevalent, especially in a, in a camp situation. Um, uh, Leisure and this guy, Van Gorder, were both killed um, later in the war. Uh, I'm working on the identity of, of this soldier, not quite sure who he is yet. So um, this is like, when we look at photographs, um, they become a template for our interpretation. And, and uh, you know, it's that if they'd have had it, they'd have used it scenario, like, um, you know, like a soldier carrying uh, two pistols in his belt, a knife and a Colt revolving rifle. Yeah, they had it, but um, not everybody used it. So, so let's look at a couple of these guys. This guy could be a reenactor today because he, he has um, really um, just purchased his hat on Sutler Row. He didn't even get the cords down all the way. His bugle is crooked and flat. Sometimes you, they're on, a, they're on a, a metallic background so you can bend them slightly to fit the hat. There's his hardy hat eagle, um, which is not holding the side of his hat up. Uh, he, I don't know what's going on with his collar. Uh, it's certainly not a federal issue coat. Um, some somebody made it for him, or he um, he altered it somewhat. The belt is a militia plate belt with a painted uh, patent leather uh, uh, leather here, and uh, just um, his whole demeanor kind of speaks to the fact that he uh, he doesn't have much much experience. In fact, this photo may have been taken before they even left, or or I surmise it could have been taken in Washington, D.C. The regiment was there for a little while, and, and some of the officers had a chance to roam around town and, and buy their equipment. Um, this is the one guy we saw in the photograph of the three men outside in, in South Carolina. I know him because he's this really flat nose, like a boxer. But look at where his shoulder straps are. I mean, how many, how many reenactors have you seen place their shoulder straps in completely the wrong place. Um, they, they belong down here, of course. There's a way to do that. There's a, a, in fact, we should talk about that sometime, about the correct placement of shoulder straps, how close they are to the seam. They're very close in the back, and they come out about a quarter to half an inch as they move forward. Um, he's wearing a commercial. When I say commercial, that means a non-issued uh, uh, blouse, which would be privately purchased, purchased with his own money. It has a lay down um, velvet collar. It's very loose fitting. And he's showing us his foot officer sword, which is a leather scabbard model. You see the brass, uh, the brass carrier here with the um, leather scabbard, the dark black scabbard. Um, so um, he obviously, he may have sewn those on himself or somebody sewed them on, but um, they would be in the way of your gear. Um, you know, your gear would ride here. So hopefully he, he uh, fixed those uh, after he saw how um, they may not have worked for him. Some uniform details. Um, uh, this is um, an officer, his name was uh, uh, James Anderson. Uh, he is wearing pretty typical regulation uniform of a second lieutenant with a light blue stripe. But look at this, he has a, a, a velvet vest. And I, I've seen this um, several times, um, these dark black or dark blue velvet vests. And they really provide a nice contrast to everything. And, and on it, he's wearing a very small core badge, which dates the photo because uh, core badges uh, came out in March of 1863. And this regiment seemed to, seemed to pick up a lot of them in uh, 1864. He also has his company letter on it on his cap, kind of reduced down from the the big bugle with the uh, one hundred in it. Um, another uh, another officer with two views, um, James McFeeters, um, obviously taken fresh fish with all his new stuff, metal scabbard. Um, this is taken a little bit later, um, and he's wearing a pin that's not a Fifth Corps badge. Um, the regiment. Before core badges were um, were uh, standardized, the regiment in, s in several regiments in the brigade uh, had this kind of a Maryland cross made because they had uh, served um, 
in uh, the Maryland area, and, and they kind of use that as a motif, uh, as a pin, as a company pin, more than a, more than a core badge. Um, Tom, I want you to notice this. This is one of my favorite uniform um, uh, kind of offshoots. Colonel's coat, but all they've done is he has a regular button-up um, civilian type coat with the Colonel's buttons added on the outside. Uh, pretty nice if you don't like, you know, pulling that, drawing that flap over and butt it, buttoning it all the time. This is an alternative way to do that. He also has very small shoulder scraps. Um, his name is Daniel Leisure. He's the father of the guy we saw back in the uh, photograph of the three men. He was a, a doctor. Um, he took time out after uh, fighting to um, uh, aid the surgeons in surgery. Uh, he was um, a subdued man, and I think it speaks to his uni uniform with the um, with the informal way that it, he's made it into a colonel's coat, and the very small uh, shoulder straps kind of speak to um, his informality and his uh, more more uh, I, I'm available to you guys approach. Uh, this on the right hand side, this is Chaplain Robert Audley Brown. He was a, a Presbyterian minister, was the chaplain of the 100th Pennsylvania. This clothing, the clothing he's wearing here is typical clergy clothing, cloth covered buttons um, uh, on the jacket. And this is a civil, civilian uh, un, or unif or clothing as uh, one might see a clergyman uh, in, eight, in the 1860s. And he chose to, um, <clears throat> he chose to outfit out himself in a regular army uniform. In fact, he wore a pistol and he rode around um, in several battles and encouraged his men to, uh, you know, keep their powder dry and fire and 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 kind of nudge them into battle. But you'll see he's wearing the same keychain here, their watch chain, as he is there. Um, he was a severe man. Uh, almost all his letters exist. He wrote once or twice a day to his wife and uh, managed um, her her financial matters and and the matters of his family from afar. Um, but he uh, eventually went on to become um, uh, the second president of Westminster College in New, New Wilmington, Pennsylvania, um, and he's a very interesting man. But again, this look gets us a look at uh, chaplain's clothing, and if he was wearing army chaplain's clothing, uh, these buttons would be covered, and um, uh, of course there's no rank, so he's conforming to that, uh, that fact. Medical staff. Um, this guy's an assistant surgeon, triple bordered. Here you can see the triple bordered shoulder straps and the old English letters MS inside of them. So it's, he's, uh, you know, immediately identifiable as, a, as someone on the staff who is in the medical uh, realm. Uh, he wears a commercial sack, sack coat with a taped um, border. It most likely had pockets. We can't see them here. Um, his buttons are staff officer's buttons. Um, they differ from the regular officer button uh, they, in the fact that they have a rim around the edge. Um, you see that in guys who serve uh, on staff. You see the rim on the edge. You see the rim on this one. And here's a good look at the triple border. One, two, three borders on his shoulder straps. Um, so this is, um, uh, he, he's pretty much outfitted himself at his own cost, that speaks to me. And the, the staff buttons are showing that he's a member of the staff as opposed to the, um, to the infantry part of the regiment. Uh, this is a private, um, his name is Moses Bell, a uh, photograph taken in Washington in Brady's studio. Uh, I show this because it, I know they were in Washington in 1862. He's wearing an officer's coat. Uh, the note, there's no trim on the sleeves, no piping. Um, I don't know how he got away with that, whether he purchased it himself or it was in fact a prop that Brady had, although I doubt it. He has a, um, a pin on, um, on his breast. That pin is um, a shield. Uh, it is not a core badge. Uh, Sutler sold a shield-shaped pin that could be engraved with the soldier's identification. Uh, his name and regiment, and most likely that's what um, Moses Bell is wearing in this photograph. 
So we're going to get to um, standardizing um, the uniforms, um, kind of the look, uh, whether it was federal or within the, within the regiment. Um, this is a photograph taken um, of a soldier. Uh, his last name was King. He was wounded in the thigh at Antietam and uh, then uh, subsequently uh, recovered in Frederick, Maryland. So uh, he's had a chance to have a change of clothing. Uh, what was interesting, just backing up a second, he was wounded um, um, on Antietam where the, uh, after passing over the, uh, over Burnside's bridge and coming up uh, the, uh, I forget the name of the farm and I'm sorry, it's just an age thing, uh, but he was hit in the thigh. His friends uh, helped them back. They, they forded the Antietam Creek uh, going in reverse away from battle. He, he says he threw his musket away in the creek. So every time I go there, I'm thinking, you know, his musket is under there. But uh, he, he was taken back to a field hospital. That field hospital was shelled. He was moved again, um, taken, put on a wagon to go to Frederick. Uh, it was discovered, uh, they wanted to amputate his leg. It was discovered that um, he, he, he violently refused having his leg amputated. So the doctors worked on him more and more and they pulled a, a one inch by two inch patch of his trousers out of the wound along with the ball. So obviously you got new trousers. Here's, here are his new trousers. And, and we know that uh, he uh, was re-outfitted with uh, better clothing. And this would, have been, um, this would have been your standard federal issue clothing. He went on to become an officer in a colored troops regiment later. This is a soldier. Um, he's an enlisted man, but um, you could, um, every once in a while, they would harvest soldiers out of regiments um, for, for different, um, I don't know, tasks. One of them was Signal Corps. Uh, this Company B uh, unknown roundhead uh, went, I'm sorry, he's known. His name is Manassas Coyle. Uh, was transferred to the Signal Corps. And even though he was in the Signal Corps, his name was still carried on the rolls of Company B, just they would enter it every time as transferred Signal Corps. But here he's wearing a standard four button and he's wearing staff buttons. Uh, they, they could be a state button, but I assume it's a staff button. And he still keeps his um, company letter B and he has a commercial um, um, forage cap that he's wearing. So uh, this is... Uh, pretty much a field taken photograph um, taken at the time because it, it actually was taken in Pittsburgh um, where they came home in 1863. So this is what he would have been wearing um, at about that time. When the regiment came home, um, it's interesting. They, uh, this regiment served in the Ninth Corps. So they were sent to South Carolina. They came back up, they fought in, uh, um, they fought at Antietam, um, Chantilly, uh, uh, Second Manassas. Uh, they went to um, uh, Fredericksburg. Then they were sent out west uh, to the army of uh, to Burnside's army out there. And um, in 1863, uh, before they uh, made their way into Kentucky and Tennessee, they elected uh, to become a veteranized regiment. Um, so what that means is they, if two thirds of the regiment would re-enlist, the regiment was given 30 days furlough. So the result of that 30 day furlough is we get a burst of photographs of portraits of guys taken in Newcastle. And not only that, but I start to see, and, and I'll point this out, these guys must have all gone to the same vendor when they came home and they bought these really long sack, commercial sack coats with lay down uh, collars, and uh, this is a seated version. We'll see a better version here soon. Um, but they're, they're, they're stopping in, having their photograph taken, and they're um, showing off some of these uniforms and some of their insignia. Um, I'm going to start out a little before that. Th these pictures were taken in, um, in Kentucky of two members of the 100th. And you see they're both in Company C. And you see the uh, different cap insignia here. And this is 1863, and they're still wearing... Um, I shouldn't say still wearing, they're not, no longer wearing a bugle. I don't think the, 
Roundhead Regiment enlisted men ever wore the bugle, but certainly the hundred and, and company letter or something you see. And also very standard issue shirt, issue four button. Um, he's got a, a vest, which makes him a little different and looks like a, a white collar. Um, you're gonna start to see um, when they come home. I, now, a lot of photographs, especially carte de visites are marked on the back that they are um, where they're taken. And these are taken in, this particular one's taken in Newcastle. But remember I showed you the uh, South Carolina painted background. And there are several backgrounds that are taken in Newcastle, like this one is one of them taken in the studio of a photographer named Phipps. Um, so uh, easily identifiable and that, that puts them back to veteran furlough and that puts them uh, back to new uniforms. Here's this long sack coat. The sleeves are even, the sleeve is rolled up, uh, maybe too long patch pockets on this one. Um, he has a company insignia. You're gonna start to see when they come home, these guys uh, are kind of throwing the insignia on the, on the hat. Company letter, number, PV, Pennsylvania Volunteers. Another one, this one is um, K100 PV. And uh, he's showing that to the camera. And notice again, the longer sack coat. This one is trimmed in um, taping, like a silk taping. And he's wearing a, a vest, like a 12 button vest with tiny ball buttons. And I assume it's a light blue color. Um, uh, on, on his vest. Again, the same background as the soldier before from the Phipps studio. This young uh, man where is, um, come back here. This young man is uh, showing his cap. I mean, he's directly showing it to the camera. I mean, these guys, some, when you look at some Civil War photographs, some of the stuff is so intentional and he's speaking to you. He's speaking to you and me. He's showing us that cap and he's telling us what regiment he is in. So he's in Company C, 100th Pennsylvania. Um, his name was Cleland. He was a substitute. He uh, went in in 1860, uh, 1863 in December and he was killed uh, five or six months later at Spotsylvania. Did not have a very long career, uh, but he's wearing um, typical federal issue clothing, four button trousers, um, vest and uh, the, the cap, of course, with the trimmed with insignia. Uh, this is another Newcastle uh, uh, photographer named Mitchell, very distinguishable by this painted fake uh, balustrade railing behind him. But um, he's in his civilian clothing, but he managed to stick his numbers on his hat, as I imagine you know, walking around town in 1863 in the winter, in the uh, winter of 1863 and beginning of 1864, you, you might want to identify as a veteran and have um, your cap with some numbers on it uh, because so many of them were home at the time. Uh, another uh, civilian, or no, I'm sorry, he, this is a military, um, a military photograph, but um, he is, his, he has a slouch hat with uh, E100 PV on it. Um, this is not a federal issue sack coat. As you see, it's got squared off bottom here and there's an inside pocket. He has something stuffed in. Um, uh, his trousers appear dark. That just might be the studio, but um, boots are, are an unusual feature here. This is 1864. So they, they kind of, when they're home, they kind of know what they need when they go back. So they're picking up, you know, pair of boots, uh, good socks, good shirts, uh, things from home that they're gonna be taking uh, back into the field. Um, here's another um, view of a guy taking it. This is in Pittsburgh in 1863, but here's the vet, the regiment has veteranized. So he has PVV on his cap, not the simple PV. And I'm, I'm not quite sure yet if that means that He's one of the original men, and, and the others where we just saw PV were guys who came in a little later. Um, but um, you'll see, I've noticed the difference. There's uh, both of these insignias appear uh, within the regiment. He's got a, a, a kepi as opposed to a forage cap. Pretty much, here's that commercial sack coat with the taping, um, big fall lay down collar, 
uh, um, vest. And um, this is the, the most typical tie I see. Um, it's a paper collar and the tie doesn't go around the neck, but it kind of wraps around the collar and then comes through into a knot. Pretty simple, pretty simple thing to, to do, but I see it a lot uh, in, in not only photographs of 100th Pennsylvania men, but others as well. Um, I've always liked this photograph because um, he's got a lot going on. You know, he's got the knife, fork, and spoon showing us, telling us something, the small testament or photo album, um, E100 PVV on his cap, taken in Pittsburgh, uh, pretty new sack coat. Here's another thing that um, you see a lot in Civil War photos. Rings were worn on the little finger. They're, they're worn on the little finger almost exclusively from photos that I see. Uh, you know, I never see them on a ring finger um, or obviously a middle finger, but almost always I see rings worn on the, on the little finger on the outside. Another great cap. Uh, this one is, um, it's a Kepi, of course, E100 PV. Um, PVV, veteran volunteers. There's the ring on the finger. Um, standard infantry frock coat. Other than that, he's kind of got everything the same. So then, you know, were these guys encouraged to buy this type of a cap? Uh, did they just like that type of a cap? And, you know, how, how trends go in our unit. Uh, uh, S&S has a particular uh, canteen with a leather strap, and then everybody runs and gets that same canteen. So it, it could be that same kind of thing going on here. I'm, I'm not sure, just this, uh, this is a lifetime worth of study, and I hope I have more lifetime to, to find out some of those answers. Uh, this picture um, is a great picture because it's very field, uh, field looking. Um, oh, get out of here. Um, this is a soldier named um, Pettit, Frederick Pettit. And if that name, uh, sounds familiar. There's a book called Infantryman Pettit. Uh, it's a collection of his uh, letters and commentary and diary. Uh, he's a fascinating guy. He's, he, he gets in the regiment in 1862. He gets thrown right into the Battle of Antietam. Never had a day of drill, he says in his, in his letter home. And he just is out there fighting like he's, uh, you know, a commando uh, moving up and firing at revs and almost got cut off from his uh, unit and and anyhow, if you want a good infantryman's um, history to read, look for infantryman Pettit. He's he's wearing a, a frock coat, and this is a thing that they did a lot with their frock coats. They flipped the collar down and almost turned it into like a lapel, like on a on a regular suit jacket that we wear today. Um, maybe that's the origin of a lapel. When you flip it up, you get the collar, and you could button it. And otherwise, it lays down. But he's pretty, he's pretty um, much in his field wear, including boots which uh, have mud, mud on them. Um, his hat with an officer's cord. Um, he was slightly wounded at Petersburg. And went back to recover. It was the only time that he wasn't on the line. And when he got back uh, to the lines, nobody told him to keep his head down. And he was sitting there writing a letter to his sister and kind of looked up over the ramparts and he got a bullet crashed into his head and he was killed, um, unfortunately, because uh, he would have been a great contributor to more uh, history of the regiment and his life ended um, too soon. I mentioned, um, you know, the similarities in, in people in, in a community. These are two brothers, Eli and Stuart Hunt, uh, both of Company E. 100th Pennsylvania. Uh, here's that background, Newcastle background from Phipps, taken at, uh, obviously, at a veteran furlough. Uh, both of them wearing, here's that Kepi again, um, just a Kepi. Uh, his has E100 PVV, pretty standard clothing. These guys have not chosen to buy the big, long sack coat. They have uh, issues sack coats. Um, my only remark I can make about these guys is after they re-enlisted, they, they, they first enlisted in 1861 in August, um, came home, re-enlisted, and uh, one was killed at Spotsylvania and the other was killed at Wilderness. So um, a, a family tragedy um, within a community. 
uh, the Newcastle background of uh, Mitchell photographer. And here you see an ordnance sergeant uh, name of Fisher um, wearing a, uh, a shell jacket. Um, he may have um, he may have had that custom made. He's got a uh, uh, looks like a, a Hardy or a private purchase slouch hat. Uh, it's pretty crisp and new. In fact, most of his clothing is pretty new. So um, he may be um, on, on furlough as well. I'm not sure exactly when this picture was taken, but uh, it's a variant uniform in the regiment to see the um, to the, to see the um, the uh, shell jacket type approach. Um, I show this because how often do you get to see inside of a hat? Um, here's the inside of this soldier's uh, hat. Slouch hats had a very wide sweatband. Um, if your sweatband isn't an inch and three quarters or two inches, then it's not really a period sweatband. Hats also had uh, silk linings in them. Um, you know, we forego a lot of that stuff. Uh, even some army issue hats, especially for officers like uh, like uh, Burnside pattern hats or uh, slouch hats did have uh, liners in them. Certainly uh, hardy hats for enlisted did not. But um, for the most part, this is a very common feature in a period hat, uh, in a military hat, the tall sweatband and um, the silk lining. So um, wearing what you have, you know, I, I kind of came up with these titles, whether they're, they nail it or not, but uh, mid to late war, you know, what you have, what you're going to wear. Uh, this, this guy, um, for some unknown reason, is wearing an anchor pin and two vests. So why? I don't know. He's got a commercial sack coat squared, squared off here, lay down lapels. Um, he is a sergeant in this photograph. He becomes a lieutenant eventually, and a very large, um, a very large piece of crepe for a tie. Um, and I suppose this picture was taken um, in 1863 or four um, as as well. Here's a here's a soldier wearing that that long sack coat. And a lot of times when I find photos taken in Western Pennsylvania that aren't identified, um, and I see this coat, I, I get a warm and fuzzy feeling like it might be one of my guys. And a lot of times I'll, you know, over the past, I've purchased them later to find out that it was, you know, find another photograph identified that it was. So this, this coat is something that, you know, it's kind of particular to this regiment uh, in the, in the post-veteran um, furlough era. And aside from that, he's pretty much got um, standard standard clothing. It looks like he, I just noticed it, it looks like he might have mounted trousers, which have a, an extra seam up, up inside here. So that's a feature I hadn't, haven't yet explored. Um, I show this because um, he's wearing a, a, a commercial sack coat. The difference is the pocket here. Not, not again, we can't see the length, but what I, what I like to show in this one is um, the pin, uh, the shield pin. Now, no longer is this a shield pin like we saw in the very beginning, but now the Ninth Corps has adopted um, their Corps badge, which is the shape of a shield with the, um, with the anchor and cannon from the Rhode Island uh, flag uh, tipping the hat to Burnside. Burnside's core. Um, so that's what um, that's what this soldier is wearing is uh, a core badge as opposed to a shield. Um, this one is about the size of a dime. It's very small, uh, as is the one he's wearing. Um, sometimes they could get really big, and I'll show you one in a minute. Um, his ha is has a shank like a button, so it could be sewn on. Um, most of them are pin types, but this one is unusual uh, due to that respect. When I say some of these badges could be large, um, that is a gigantic Ninth Corps badge that is upside down uh, for an unknown reason, whether he didn't know, looking down, he pinned it on the right way. Um, but it's a large um, shield with an applied extra piece cannon and um, anchor, and it probably has a red enamel background behind it as well. Uh, for first division, but here, 
you see that long sack coat again. I mean, this is a frock length sack coat with huge, this one is the most uh, outrageous one I've ever come across. Huge um, balloon sleeves tight at the uh, wrist. Um, he, has, he also has a commercial one, the squared off one as opposed to the really long one. Um, but this is a very, very crazy look at that variant of a sack coat that uh, runs in this particular regiment. Don't often get a good look at a shirt. Here, here's a shirt. Uh, he's a captain, so it's not an issue shirt. Uh, he is wearing a paper collar. He is not wearing suspenders. Um, maybe his, he doesn't need to, or um, he's just a guy that doesn't wear suspenders. Uh, you know, we all, I, I think my pants would be around my knees without my suspenders. So uh, um, he may have his pants fitted better, or that little tiny um, uh, device in the back, the little belt, he may, it may work for him to have it cinched up and be in the right place. Uh, this is um, a, uh, this is a variant. This is a modification you see in some federal uniforms. Again, this is a soldier from the 100th Pennsylvania. It was taken in South Carolina. It's been trimmed out. Here's the um, flag on the on the table. You would see the pine or the palm tree background if it were completely there. He's taken his four button and added buttons in between. You see that occasionally in federal uniforms. It's kind of a neat idea. Um, to make the four button less sloppy looking. Um, and I, I kind of like this modification. I think it's kind of ingenious. And I have seen several uh, reenactors use that, this idea, but certainly it's an idea that was um, probably seen more than was photographed. Uh, I just thought I needed to show, uh, you know, standard uh, overcoat with the light blue vest, uh, apparently and um, light trousers. There's really nothing um, uh, interesting about it other than he is a member of the regiment. And I have very few photographs showing them wearing overcoats. Um, the uh, Mitchell background taken in Newcastle. I'm not 100% sure he's a member of the regiment because several regiments came from there. Um, my, my goal here is to show the uh, cutoff frock coat and a veteran stripe. Uh, you don't normally see veterans, I don't normally see them in, uh, in soldiers from the regiment. So this is uh, a little bit unusual. And again, just another, another uniform that um, pops up uh, locally for, for me. Um, this is my last slide. Um, this is a photograph of their colors. These were the last colors that were presented to them uh, in 1865 that clearly show um, the number of engagements they are in. And uh, you can see every stripe is um, decorated with at least one, two, or three uh, battles. Um, um, they lost most of their flag. It wasn't captured. Uh, Rebel grabbed a big hunk of it and tore it off in the crater, but they managed to bring the pole and the rest of the fragments back. And the uh, Rebel turned, it in as, uh, turned the canton in as a captured piece um, but the regiment uh, denied uh, vehemently that it had ever been captured. Uh, but subsequently, they were issued this new set of colors uh, in 1865, the end of the war. So um, saying that, uh, that being the case and being over, I guess I, I'm open for questions if we can or if we want to, if you have any. Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, it's Walt. Hey, Walt. I, I had to say, watching this is just incredible because as you well know, we both grew up in Newcastle in the Newcastle area. We did. I'm sure Elijah Bracken probably taught some of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And it was just fun to hear names like Plain Grove, New Wilmington, Volant, uh, uh, and just to know that you know, these people were people that knew our people and were next to our neighbors. Uh, I'm sure we've all had this experience in one way or another, but to actually see this today, uh, incredible. Just loved it. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Um, I'm working right now with two other uh, people to, we're, we want to, we're doing a book. It's a photographic history of the 100th Pennsylvania. Um, we have, along with my two or 300 photos, probably another 200 photos, so we're trying to figure out a format and 
how to how to make this uh, affordable and and not not huge um, but yeah it does really speak to a, a community which um, you know all of you know when you drive around and you see cemeteries and and the stones and roads that are named after um, people and, and this kind of all this kind of all gels and comes together at some point and in you know i can't i can't go not go back to my hometown and not see those names in the streets and um you know know where those two photography studios were and um you know who who went who left and who who didn't come back so it's important the photographic record's pretty important yeah it's nice to know now uh lesher avenue yeah it's named yeah. after yeah yeah All right, we have a few questions. Warren, if you want to unmute, ask your question. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation, Mike. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, my question is, uh, the, the rings on the little finger, uh, were they wedding bands? or What's the significance of wearing it on the little finger? And do you know what kind of rings they are? I don't. Um, I do know that several types of, of rings were available. Um, first of all, a lot of soldiers carved rings out of uh, burl wood or even gutta percha, like a piece of gutta percha, um, uh, uh, you know, some object made out of gutta percha could be used and carved into a ring. There are a number of those recovered on battlefield sites. Sutler sold a, a silver ring that um, had a, a, it was like an identification name. With a, it was a band that had your name and regiment stamped into it. Uh, which is an interesting thing. A lot of those are recovered and collectors uh, pretty much prize those. Um, I don't know about wedding rings. I mean, I assume some wedding rings were worn and, and you know, I don't know about you, but I, I can't wear a ring on my little finger without losing it. They come off pretty easily. So these guys might have just been wearing them for the photograph, you know, showing oh, it off. Right. Yeah. Um, but I would think that they were kind of soldier stuff that they bought or made, uh, the ones that we're seeing in the photos. There, you know, there's some good books about um, excavated relics um, from different theaters of the war. And, uh, you know, there, I would recommend any of those to people to see what, because these are things that soldiers dropped and left behind. Uh, and, and you'll find a number of rings and handmade core badges and carved bullets and those kind of things. Uh, that are in there. But yeah, I'm still on the search for, you know, what type of rings were worn, why, and, yeah. um, you know, that that um, that manner of, of fashion. Oh, I wonder if we'll see an outbreak of pinky rings after your talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be you. responsible for that. I'd be happy to. Thank you, Mike. Ken, mm -hmm. Ken Derenbacher, you have a question? You want to unmute your microphone? Yeah, uh, great. I was surprised to see a lot of looks like dark blue vests, and maybe they're you know, even with military buttons on them and watches for the for the enlisted men. You know, as a reenactor for years and years, I always told me you know, that that's for the officers. Yeah, they're trying to purchase. Yeah, well, there's the evidence right there right. that um, you know they were wearing them. It, it's a good piece of technology, and they were picking it up and using it. Um, Michael, um, as far as the rings go, I think there's a chapter in Compendium all about rings. And okay. so I'll take a look and, and pass it on to you first and foremost, and then you can um, take it from there. Thanks. I, you know, I think I have the Compendium. Uh, take a look. I'm pretty sure O'Byrne talked about it. So. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I will. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Mm. That uh, colonel's coat you saw with the uh, buttons, that almost yeah. looked like a placket sewn into the coat, you know, like the Zouaves wore. Because I noticed he had, no, the, no. he had the two flaps buttoned back, and then he had the- No, they weren't. No, no. Oh, okay. No, it was just a it had a regular button front. The buttons were sewn on the outside of the coat. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, just I, a regular I, coat, imagine. Right. And you have a regular black coat with black buttons, and then you just sew kernel buttons on the outside. Oh, okay. From what I saw, it looked like he had folded the kernel flaps back and then had the, okay. All yeah, right. no, I think that's what, 
you know, he, you know, we, you know how hard it is to button that thing, and if it's unbuttoned, yes, it's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that was his solution to it, or a solution to it. Yeah, the best thing is when you get it buttoned up, put your sword belt on, and then realize you've misbuttoned it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, all yeah. seven of them. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mike. Good presentation. You're very welcome.